All right. Um, am I audible in the back? All good. Okay. Uh, screen. All good. All right. So uh, today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about multimodal retrieval augmented generation uh, flavor of RAG. Um, and we'll be using the Gemini model. Uh, if you have attended one of the sessions yesterday uh, from one of my colleague Ravi, uh, you would have sort of gotten a chance to see what uh, Gemini models are and what they can do. Uh, in fact, they have sort of multimodal capabilities, which means you can do image, video, and a lot of other things, right? Um, I will not be spending too much time with those capabilities, like the foundational capabilities of the model. What we will be discussing is how do you sort of take that and then sort of do something uh, which is more multimodal RAG. But before I start, let's just sort of sense how many of you know what RAG is. Just raise your hand. Good. I think pretty much 40% of the people know. Do you, do you know what multimodal RAG is? The same folks? Some of you? OK. OK. So more or less, I think the multimodal RAG and the RAG remain same in a sense that the, the overall architecture sort of is pretty much similar. It's just that now you have more kinds and modalities of data to deal with, right? And we'll see how that is done and what do you need to do. Uh, this is a workshop. So this is not going to be too much presentation. We'll actually do hands-on. There's a notebook. We'll go through that notebook. There's a lot of code which is involved. Um, for all intent purposes, I am not going to talk about any external third-party tool like LangChain or anything. They do have support for all of this. You sort of feel free to sort of explore that. What I am going to show you is something which is sort of vanilla in a sense that that has been written from the ground up. And it sort of does multimodal drag, leveraging the Gemini model, right? So this is not a LangChain talk. This is not a Llama index talk. This is purely multimodal drag using the Gemini, right? And again, like I said, so this is a hands-on in a sense that I'll be doing the hands-on. I'll show you how you can do the same hands-on going back after this. Um, but you'll not be sort of, uh, you'll not be able to do this along with me. I have Raga with me. I don't know where he's, he's here. Uh, if you have any questions, in terms of the lab, uh, please reach out to him. He's sitting here um, so that they can help you with uh, in terms of credits and things like that. Because again, this is cloud. This is not typically like a Google API where you have things for free uh, in a sense that you get the key and then you can just start running. There's a lot of things you need to set up. And I'll walk you through the initial stages in that, right? That's a rough agenda. We'll, we may or may not follow this. Um, we'll sort of try to go as per the flow. OK. So this is what you take a, please take a, a screenshot, um, sorry, take a picture. This is what will give you an access to the lab, uh, the same lab that I'll be doing to showcase everything. Um, so please make sure that you take a photo um, and you sort of open this with whatever accounts that you're uh, using in the Google Cloud. So there are some steps that you need to follow. Um, what I'll do is I'll show you those before we jump there. Yeah. So this will give you access to the free things. Yeah. Not trying to take money <laughs> right now. Uh, but by the way, th there is uh, th there are ways. Uh, so there is something which I'll show towards the end. Uh, and you can get more details about it in the booth that we have in the outside. But let me show you how this works, right? So you've taken the uh, photo. So if you click, either you go to the QR code or if you click on this, this will actually take you to the Cloud Skill Boost. Uh, for many of you, you may know what Cloud Skill Boost is if you have been working with Google Cloud in general. If you don't know what it is, uh, it's again like a learning platform where you have courses, labs, and all of this. Uh, it's an easy way to get access to all the things cloud without sort of spending too much money. So I click on this. This takes me to uh, my account. As you can see, this takes me, and I'm already logged in. Uh, I would not be opening this, because this will show my email. Uh, but once you sort of click on this, you'll get to this part. And this is where you need to do all the things, at least the pre-steps of all that we'll sort of explore in the notebook. This is one. And I'll come back to this. Uh, the other thing is, and again, please just take a screenshot of this. All that I will talk about today is sitting on this repository. Um, take a screenshot. I'll probably sort of increase the font. Uh, it is sitting inside Generative AI, Google Cloud Platform. 
And then all the notebooks that I'm going to talk about are sort of here somewhere. And there are a lot of notebooks. So if, in general, you're trying to learn how to use generative AI on Google Cloud, whether it's Power Models, Gemini Models, you want to do multiple things with that, this is the repository that you need to uh, sort of get into. If you don't remember it, or if you've sort of, you have not taken the um, photo of this, the other thing you can do is use Google. You can just say generative AI, GCP, GitHub. And I think the first link is this. So you can do it this way as well. So generative AI, GCP, GitHub takes you to this, which is the same link as what I'm going to show you. The reason I want to sh share this is because the, the notebook that we're going to do today as part of the workshop is also here. So anyway, you have to come here. The second thing is when you go to the catalog inside Google uh, Cloud Skill Boost, the course that you're going to do um, will do a Git clone of the same repo. So either way, either you access it through here or you want to do this otherwise, it's completely your choice. The only thing you need to remember is all these notebooks would require a billing account from the cloud for you to run those notebooks, right? So, and I've mentioned this uh, initially. So once you're here, uh, what you need to do is you need to find generative AI. So there are sort of multiple courses. The one that we are interested in is this one, Generative AI Explorer Vertex AI. In fact, let me sort of increase my font. This is visible in the back? OK. So uh, Generative AI Explorer Vertex AI, this is the lab, uh, which will give you exactly the same access as what I have, which means you will be able to run everything. You click on this, it will give you three courses, and each course requires one credit. So when you click on that, uh, the link that I showed you initially, it will give you three or four, or maybe I, I'm not sure how many credits, but it gives you access to this, right? Um, and all you have to do now is you go here, and you see there are three labs. Just click any one. Uh, so I'm clicking the first one. And you can just click on Start Lab, right? So this is sort of, it'll take 30 seconds or 90 seconds, and sometimes not. Um, and then all you have to do is, so it gives you the username and password uh, and the project ID. This is very important, right? So this is where it costs money, right? So you, if you were to do this on your own system, this will create an issue because you have to add a billing account and all of that. So this gives you that. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply open this. It will copy the same uh, student ID that you see there. I'll just copy my password. Please do not copy that. Uh, OK, so I'll do this. And there you go. Uh, so once I come here, I sort of have the Google Cloud access. And you can again see that this is not my account, right? This is not my account, my corporate account, or anything. In fact, I can show you if I see on the top right. So if I see on the top right, you will see that this is not the account, right? And fortunately, you see my Google ID as well. But uh, this is this is the account that I should be logged into, right? So this is important because again, be very careful when you run these things. It will incur billing, which means you'll end up sort of paying. I'm fine if you are fine with it, but make sure that you're sort of logged in into the account that we have given, right? So far, so good. All good? Again, these are things you can't do right now, so sorry for that. But at least when you go back and when you're trying to do this, make sure that you're following the same things. OK, perfect. So what we'll do is, and uh, again, this, there's not too much of presentation. Like I said, this is very hands-on. We do a lot of uh, developer things and stuff around this. So I'll go to the Vertex AI. How many of you know Vertex AI? A lot of you? Good, good. Um, so for those of you who don't know what Vertex AI is, um, Vertex AI is better than SageMaker, uh, if you don't know. <laughs> for those of you who know, um, so, the, so Vertex AI is the GCP offering for machine learning. So you can think of it as a platform where you have everything from ML to MLOps, LLMs to LLMOps. So all the things under the bucket of uh, AI is sort of as part of the Vertex AI, right? So, if you're trying to run models, if you're trying to build machine learning pipelines, if you're trying to build, let's say, LLMs, or if you're trying to uh, use uh, Llama 2 or any of those things, all of this is inside Vertex AI as a platform. So inside GCP, you have Vertex AI. Vertex AI has all of these things. 
Now I'll sort of give a uh, view of this Vertex AI um, because it's very important for us to understand the positioning of the products that we're going to use today, right? On the left, you will see all the different sub-products. So Vertex AI itself is a big product. And again, Vertex AI has its own SDK. So it's not just the UI, but there's an SDK, which we'll see today, that how we are using those LLMs and all. Uh, but this has a SDK backend as well. So you either use the UI or you use the SDK. It's completely your choice. But on the left-hand side, uh, you see the sub-products. So in the third one is the pipeline. So again, for those of you who know for some reason what KFP is. Anybody who can tell me the full form of KFP? Anybody? The last P is pipeline. Uh, what could be the first two? Yes. Yes, so KF is Qflow, um, which means some of you have not done pipelines yet. Um, but okay, so if, if you were to sort of do KFP or let's say Q, uh, Q4 pli pipelines or in general machine learning pipelines, this is the place you'll go, and this has, again, everything that you would uh, care about. You can sort of use a template and all of that. But again, this session is not about ML, so I'll just focus on the, uh, the generative AI part of it. So one very interesting thing that, th that it has is something that we call as model garden. So model garden, um, as the name says, is a garden of models. So this is where you'll have all the different models, be it Google foundational models, or let's say Facebook foundation models, or any open source model for that matter. So it's not just the LLMs, but even uh, image recognition models, image segmentation models. So Model Garden is one of those services which is very interesting because this is where, for example, you can see Claude is there, uh, you can see Gemini is there, you can see Palm being there, you see the YOLO being there. Uh, in fact, I think very recently they added the media pipe is there. Uh, so there, there are a lot of LLMs. So you have Mixtral 7B is there, Llama 2 are there. So everything is there, right? So again, as part of GCP, we, we usually sort of uh, always prefer giving customers everything as an access. So we don't sort of bound them that, hey, you just have to use Gemini. Uh, we would love that, but we at least sort of give them an option where they can play with this. So this is one of those services where you not only can use the model, uh, but you can also sort of put them in production directly using the pipeline. So all of this is self-service, which means you take Llama 2, you take Mixtrel, and you use the Google Cloud Infra, and then host those models and use them directly. Uh, and it doesn't end there, because you can also sort of use the Infra to do the tuning part as well. So this is where Model Garden is a very important service. Then we come to... Um, the other two services, which is very interesting, um, I'm sure all of you use Colab, right? Um, so there's also a Colab, Colab Enterprise. Again, I'm not sure if you guys know, but there's also an enterprise version of this, uh, which means it's very similar to Colab. The only difference is, uh, and sometimes you'll get this, uh, which simply means that these services has not been enabled because this is the first time you're logging into this whole thing, right? So anyway, uh, the Colab Enterprise is very similar to Colab that you all love and use. It's just that now you can connect it with your machines, machines which are local. The problem with Colab, and you would know this, is that when you have to work on your own data, you don't trust Google at that point, right? You should, but you don't, right? Um, and this is where the Colab Enterprise comes into handy, which is the exact same thing. For example, I can just say, create a new notebook, and you get to see the same interface and every functionality is pretty much the same. But this time, you can actually connect to your do uh, data sources. You can have your own instance of machines, which is housing your data, which means there's proper uh, sort of access controls which are there so that nobody else can have access, including Google, Google Cloud. Nobody has access to your data. So that, that's, that's pretty much it, right? So this is the Colab. Uh, and the one that we'll use today is the Workbench. Workbench is, and sooner this will be phasing out, Workbench is more like, how about uh, having a Jupyter Lab hosted, again, based on the machine that I choose. So for some reason, if, you're, if you need, let's say, 300 GB of RAM, this is what you would be doing, right? So these are some of the services, and let me come to the most important, which is the Vertex AI Studio. So this is where all the generative AI features are there. So if you go to the... Um, Overview, it sort of gives you that uh, there are uh, language models, there are vision models, there are speech models. 
So let me sort of show you the multimodal. So the multimodal, and it has sort of samples that you can play with. Let me open just one so that, you know, you, again, you get the gist of it, uh, what these models are and what they can do. So let's say we open this. Um, this is very interesting. This is a few shot prompt where we have an image. So I don't know if this is visible, but let me sort of increase the size. But uh, if you see, what we're doing is we're saying, here's an image, and you can clearly see this is a uh, Colosseum image. And we're giving this as an example in a JSON format. We are saying city is Rome, landmark is this, right? And then we, gis we give the second example. We say city is Beijing, landmark is this, right? And then the third one, we actually don't do anything, right? This is a very, very simple few shot program. So this is that studio where you can sort of play with many of the things uh, of the generative AI, which is what we'll be leveraging. And this is what on the top right, so if I sort of zoom this up, you will see that you have the model, which is Gemini Pro. One thing which is very important for all of you to remember is uh, Gemini has two flavors, right? So there is Gemini Pro, and then there is Gemini Pro Vision. Gemini Pro is only text model. Gemini Pro Vision is the model, which is multimodal, which can take images, which can take uh, videos and which can also take audio at some point in the future, uh, which will be coming soon. So if you were to leverage any of these features, you need to use Gemini Pro Vision. This will make sense when we'll actually use the API. The other thing which is interesting is, if I sort of reset this, and let me sort of submit this so that we can see the output. I hope it doesn't fail. Um, but on the top right, you can also see that there is something called as get code. So what get code essentially means is that if you were to sort of export this, and for some reason you want to sort of do this from an API perspective, it sort of gives you the code. It tells you how you would use the Vertex SDK, um, call the model, you can see the Gemini provision model, and then pass the same prompt so that it gives you the, um, it gives you the output in that sense, right? And you can see that this is how sort of the byte file of the image will look like and so on and so forth. So let's see, do we have the output? Oh yeah, we do. Um, so if you see this, it says city is Rio de Janeiro, landmark is Christ the Redeemer. So it did two things. One, it has the intelligence to know what's going on in the image. And the second, it maintained the structure of the output because we were doing this in the few shot, right? So at least you're convinced that it has capability to read images. And the, these subtle small things are very important because we'll sort of build up on this, right? So everybody is sort of okay with this so far that we have, we can put an image to Gemini and sort of have as, assume that there is a way that it can understand what's going on, right? So far so good? Okay. So this is going to be crucial because, like I said, when we are going to read a document which has the combination of image and text, uh, it needs to read that image as well, right? Okay, so I'm going to stop here. Uh, what we'll do is we are going to go back to our presentation. Uh, this was something very basic things that you need to set up. Let me sort of come to the slideshow. Okay. So let's sort of uh, go back to some of the basic things that we need to discuss uh, now that we have seen a very little basics around it. The typical way we work with LLMs, and again, most of the things that I'll say has nothing to do with Gemini in general, but it has to do with all the different kinds of models that we have. The typical way we work with LLMs is that you sit on the other side writing the prompt and then you get something like generation, summarization, q &A, right? So that's a very simple, um, uh, simple instruction pattern that we have. But the big issue with uh, these, sort of most of these uh, LLMs are, is the fact that you don't know when it is going to hallucinate. So this is a very interesting example. Again, for those of you who know what Langchain is, which I'm assuming 99% people, you can see the response which is on the left and this, and see the response which is on the right. By the way, none of the LMs will do this mistake right now because they have been trained with this. But it's a good example to see that how sort of most of the LLMs, uh, when you ask them what Langchain is, sort of make something up. So on the left, it says that Langchain is a blockchain-based platform that allows users to create, share, and learn language. Like if you don't know what Langchain is, you would believe the first one, right? Like it, it sort of makes a lot of sense if you see the first one because lang chain would have something to do with blockchain or something like that. So this is the kind of problem we are trying to address, right? So this is important for us to know that while multimodal drag is something which is cool, 
what exactly are we trying to address? So this is problem statement one. We want to make sure that something like this doesn't happen. What is the solution for this? If I were to ask any of you, like if you were to solve this problem using LLM, how would you solve this? Anybody just raise your hand and, yes? Grad. Sorry, grad? Retrieval generation. Right, tell me how would you do that? Assuming let's say nobody knows what drag is for a moment. Right, so what you'll typically do is you'll say, hey, I'm giving you a blog. There is a definition of Langstein given. If I'm asking you what is Langstein, make sure that you read from that blog or whatever that source of knowledge is, right? So pretty much that's how we solve it. And this is what we call as RAG. RAG is nothing sort of fancy, like it looks fancy, but it's very simple in that sense. Okay, good. So what we need from an enterprise perspective is a bit more ideal. So what we need, just like he said, is that your LLM should have access to all of these different kinds of sources in your enterprise. It should not have access to the Google information or the world information. What it should have is the access to all the data which is sitting in your enterprise. And that could be structured data, unstructured data, PDFs, SQL databases, and it could be thousands of other sort of varieties of data, right? Now, all of that is very well. The problem is most of the LLMs cannot process the images or the other modalities of the data. Is that fair assumption? Like the RAG that we do right now, or even just a simple like adding a knowledge base as a context, it works well when you are dealing with the text side of things, right? That's where the things or the restrictions are. So this is what we want from an ideal scenario. So again, there are a lot of naive solution. I'm going to sort of skip to it. Um, but typically, if you see the architecture of RAG, there are two major components in the RAG architecture. One is the retriever, and the other is the generator. The retriever is pretty simple. And before I come to this, I want to sort of come to this particular slide. Because exactly what he said, right? He said, you know what? Let's say you're trying to ask a question, um, whatever that question is. What you should be able to do is you should be able to add a context. So if you see in the whole prompt, there's a context called as retrieved information, right? So the goal is very simple, like at the very small level, and then we'll sort of scale out and see that how this is not scalable and possible. The goal is whatever question I ask, the question has an intent where the answer is available in the enterprise knowledge base. The context should automatically come, and then I should be able to give the answer. Correct? That's pretty much very standard template of it. And then you put your question, and then expect the LLM to answer. All good, unless how do you know, apart from manually, which context to provide? Now think for a moment that you're asking the Langstein question. And when he was also giving the answer, I said, yeah, we'll put the Langstein blog or wherever the Langstein information is given, and we'll get the answer. But the problem is, how would we know that in the first place, right? Like, that answer could be available in thousands and thousands of documents, and you still would have to get to that part, right? Is this making sense? So the big problem here is not the basic architecture of solving it. The problem is, how do you scale it so that whatever the question user asks, it should be able to figure out the relevant context from the end documents and then get it and put it here as a prompt, correct? That's pretty much how you solve the RAG problem. That is also true when you do the multimodal as well, because again, irrespective of whether multimodal is image or video, you still would want the uh, context to be sort of dynamically figured out. Now, if you come back to this, do you now understand what retriever is trying to do, right? It's a very general retriever. What Retriever is doing, or this is where the vector search sort of comes in ha handy, right? All the words that we keep hearing, vector databases and all, is nothing but a way for you to find needle in the haystack. So if you have, let's say, billions of documents, and by the way, if you really think about it, this is how Google search works. Like when you type something from the billions of pages on the internet, it gives you the top 10 pages, right? Based on certain page rank algorithm. That's exactly what retrievers are doing. It's saying whatever question you're asking, let me go to billions of vectors which are representing the core document, and let me give you the top 10 from where the information might be available. It's just that it goes one step ahead. So Google search stops at the moment you get the top 10 results, right? This is where the generator piece is given. Now think about it. What generator will do is it'll take the content of all those 10 sort of top 10 uh, uh, documents, and then it'll ask uh, any LLM the same question. 
say, okay, take the context of those 10 sort of document, ask the same question. What this will do is you'll now get one single output out of it. Correct? And this is a step ahead of, you know, something like Google search. This is why on Google search, if you see, um, and this is sort of enabled in India, which is the search uh, generative experience, right? So you type something and it sort of gives you the answer. How is it doing? It's doing in the same way. You have a retriever, which is the same page uh, rank algorithm, which is sort of giving you the best of what you're asking. And then that goes to Gemini. The Gemini then sort of solidifies and sort of understands the whole information and provides you a more comprehensive answer after reading the top 10 papers and things like that, along with the citations and everything. So that is what the RAG overall is, right? In a very simple term, that is RAG. Uh, let me take a pause. If I have a question for all of you, uh, and it's okay if, if you know sort of that is a wrong answer, but it's more of a discussion at this point. Do you think something should have to change when you do multimodal? So again, let me sort of clarify when I say multimodal, I am saying modalities other than text. It could be image, it could be video, it could be audio. Do you think that architecture sort of changes the moment we bring other modalities? Just give it a try. It doesn't have to be right or wrong. And that's what we are trying to explore today. Yes? Different encoders? Okay. Here it is only mentioned a text encoder. Right. So yeah. you'll have different encoders? Yeah, vision encoder, audio encoder. To do what exactly? Uh, to encode uh, the other modalities in the same space of uh, text. Correct. In the same space of numbers, essentially. Yeah, correct. Mm. Right, so okay, one thing that we all know is that when we do embeddings, like the text embedding, you take a modality of text, you convert that into numbers. Those numbers are then sort of projected in the vector space. That's why we call them as vector, right? Very simple. That's what he was saying. He's saying, okay, if, if, if I can do that with text converted to numbers, can I do something similar with image? Take an image, convert the modality, or let's say the transformation or the encoding to numbers. Because then, if I have numbers for everything, do you agree I can then do similarities and dissimilarity? Which means I can then, if, if all of this is just a numbers in a vector space, I can actually compare one image with the other image and say how similar they are. I can compare one text to the image and say how similar they are. Correct? And it sounds very simple. And of course, you'll then ask the question that, hey, how does that encoding work? It has to be brilliant, right? Because it has to encode all the information which is present. But so far, are you guys with me that all we need to do in this architecture is that just like you had a vector which is translating from the text to numbers, can we just do the same thing with images and videos? Sounds good. Once all of them are in the numbers, then we'll see what happens. And what to use with that is the other thing that we'll figure out. So first, yes. Yes, so that's the other part of the cycle. This is more sort of op side of things, which is once you have the answer, let's say for some reason the answer is wrong, you would want the RLHF, you would want the tuning of the algorithm. There's a lot of layer which is on the op side. We are not going there. First, we are sort of solving a very basic problem. So we'll build up to that. And of course, the ops is not the part of this uh, sort of session as well. Um, but you're right, like you would sort of build that layer, which is very similar to how you do the ML. Like you first do the data pre-processing, you do the EDA, you build the model, then the models are good, and then you build the ops pipeline, which is that feedback loop and all that, right? Okay, so far so good. We now have understood that pretty much if you were to do a multimodal drag, all you need is a way for you to convert the images and videos to some kind of number so that all of them can be projected in the same space. Everybody agrees to that? Good. So that's all we need. Um, and, uh, and we'll see that sort of example uh, in the hands-on. But again, this, this, this is just an example of how sort of uh, la uh, the, the example of text-based chunking when you do the ingestion in the data. So you have a data, you sort of chunk it, you create the embedding. So this is where we said we need the same capability for the images as well, right? That's pretty much what we are saying. All right. So you'll be pissed off if I say the session is over, right? Um, 
So this is what, this is again just to sort of in the same, whatever I just said, these are the same images which are saying the same thing. Okay, let's come to this. Now, before again we go there, let's see what are we trying to solve, right? So this is one of the document. Um, and if you see this document, very interestingly, this document has combination of multiple things, right? You can see a normal text, you can see a graph, you can see a table. So far, and tell me uh, based on your experience, if you have not sort of played with multimodal uh, models so far, you have no way of integrating the knowledge of the graph and the table into the text. Correct? Again, I'm saying you might have played with multimodal models and all that, and you would have been able to do that. But let's keep that aside for a moment. If you were to do just the normal sort of LLMs in the RAG, you'll not be able to get the information of the graph and the table. Correct? That's pretty much what we'll try to see in today's hands-on, which is how would I take the information of the graph and the table and ask comparative question, which is trying to compare a graph with a text or two graphs with each other. Would that be amazing if we were to do that? Right? Okay. So this is what we are trying to solve. So this is that uh, sample document. Um, again, all of this is available on that GitHub. None of this is sort of closed source. The, the whole source of this is also available. I'm going to walk you through some of the outputs before, uh, before we run this. This is the output, the first output that you'll see. So we'll sort of take this document, we'll run through the embedding. And on the top, you will see a text metadata. And in the bottom, you'll see the image metadata, right? Uh, in fact, sorry, this is both text. I think image is this one. So the text metadata is as simple as saying that you take the data, you go through each page, you divide them into chunks and send it to an embedding model. And the embedding models gives you a bunch of numbers, right? So this is that number. And let me see if I can do, can I do this? Okay. So this, these numbers that you saw is exactly what we discussed, right? We said, if I can take input of text or image or video and give a number output, then we can do these basic cosine similarities and dissimilarities, right? That was the basic premise. Okay, now let's stop it here. I'm going to go back to the lab. So the notebook that we are going to use uh, for this particular thing, oops. So in that folder that I said, and you can take a, again, take a photo of it so that you remember, this is the notebook that we are using. Uh, so we are inside Generative AI, the root folder in that Gemini, in that use cases, and there's a folder called as Retrieval Augmented Generation. Again, just so that you know, um, we are not using any external libraries. We are not using Langchain. We are not using Llama Index. You can do all of the same things in there. This is a very neutral solution. This is more from an architectural perspective that you know how this is done, right? So two things, the, notebooks, uh, the notebook is here. The code behind the notebook, and because there's a lot of things that you have to do, is inside the utils folder, which is this file, intro to multimodal rag. Again, take a photo so that you remember the actual code uh, of all the things that we'll see today, um, at least from a utils or the processing perspective, is sitting inside this. And this is, again, I think, uh, 1,000 lines of codes, uh, which is essentially sort of going to do exactly everything that you'll see on the notebook. So feel free to sort of look into the code, see what we are doing. You might find bugs. You might find something which may not be correct uh, because people have, and you can see that I actually recently fixed one of the bugs. So feel free to sort of go with the bugs, uh, uh, go with the code and see if you can po point out something. But if you're trying to learn the very foundation of how multimodal drag has to be done, it is important that you go through the code and learn through it because this will help you. And it's a very simply written code. It's not sort of complicated. But there are two components which I want to talk about. Um, one is this function, which is very interesting, uh, get text embedding from text embedding model. So Vertex AI, uh, and again, please do not get confused with Google AI embeddings because that's the outside world where things are free. And then there's Vertex AI where it's part of the cloud. So there are two embeddings that you should be aware of. Google Cloud has a text embedding model, which is this, uh, what you see here. 
and then you have a multimodal embedding model which is this so there are two embeddings and let me sort of talk about this what they are um, so the text embedding model essentially means as a service is that you put a text and then you get the numbers out the multimodal embedding is you put the image it gives you the numbers out as well as you can also put video and it gives you back uh, the numbers out so how do you sort of learn more about it if you were to just do multimodal embeddings vertex there you go uh, if you see the first one I'm not trying to sell Google I'm just it's much easier way of sort of getting to the links so if you see the first link this is the multimodal embedding super helpful this is 1408 uh, sort of uh, uh, dimensions and you can do sort of image video uh, you can also do caption along with the image so if your image has for some reason captions you can also send that so what this service does is it, again like I said image text and video what this service does is you can sort of build search engines around it so you take an image you push it to this API this API gives you the number and then you can sort of do a bunch of things so this is what you need to sort of uh, uh, sort of refer uh, when it comes to the uh, multimodal embeddings uh, please take a photo so that you can go back and refer to this um, and sort of explore this more Okay. Sorry? They would have to kill me if I know the answer. Uh, they do use something very similar, but not this one. This is more tuned. Um, and again, you would know this. Think about this from a uh, perspective of the privacy, right? What, there are a lot of things when you do the normal Google search or Google image search and all, there are a lot of data sets which don't have a legal compliance to be used with the customers. When you work with customers, they have their own GDPR and thousands of other things, right? So it may be same model, but it may not be using the same set of data points. This is, by the way, this is a very important point because this is where the consumer LLMs versus the enterprise LLMs also are slightly different because there are some data sets which are pulled out of when you get the access of the same. So Gemini when you see on BARD versus Gemini when you see on Vertex, there is a difference. Why? Because some of the data sets have been pulled because you're serving the enterprise versus the consumer. The SLA is a different. It's, it's exactly same. When you do chat GPT or the GPT-4 model, the GPT-4 of chat GPT versus the GPT-4 of Azure, there's a difference. What is that difference is something that you can evaluate and go through, but there is a difference. We should all know that, right? So this is that embedding model. And then similarly, you have vertex text embeddings. So just like you had the uh, multimodal, this is again the text embedding. So these are the two, uh, two models and the API that we're gonna leverage uh, for the work that we're doing, right? Please take a photo so that you remember that these are the two major components of what we are doing. Okay, so let's go back to, oh sorry, you were taking photo, please take. Is it multilingual as well? Is it yes, it is. Multilingual as well? it is. By default, the text embeddings are multilingual. So if you were to sort of do a translation or ask a question in Hindi, it will still match you with the English text, which is close to it. So that's the beauty of it. In fact, it also tells you how many languages it supports. Somewhere, if you read through it, it'll tell you what, what are the languages. So it's, it's not all, but it's, I think, 20, 25 languages. By the way, before we go to the further part, any questions? Yeah, go ahead. So does it also support English, like, you know, you are talking in Hindi and English mixed or maybe other languages also mixed? So the other, yes, like if you were to ask the question in Tamil and then you're trying to search English language, it does. The English is sort of tricky. It does give you, but it's the, the performance is not really great. And it's out of the board, like none of the languages will do, unless, of course, you train that model with the English text. As of now, it doesn't support English as a language. It supports Hindi and English, so it does that sort of somewhat. Uh, that's why I'm saying it's like, it's okay. We have tried that, it doesn't sort of work great. If you do sort of complex thing. Okay, thank you. Right. Any other questions? Yes. Sorry, uh, I'll take his and then I'll come to you. Are the video embedding models multilingual as well? Like, based on these, I 
good question so the video when you send a video it it doesn't process the audio of that video so even if you have the audio in that video it will not process it all it is doing in a very simple sense is it is it's extracting those frames and then put together it is building a uh, embedding out of it so it, it doesn't have audio which means there's no language so that is again referred to as the image so that is read so for example if uh, and we'll see that example by the way uh, if something is written on that image, it will sort of have a capability to infer that knowledge out of it. So it can do that. Yes. Oh, sorry, I missed him. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll come to you. We'll just take one more question after him and then we are. Hello. Yeah, so uh, you mentioned there are two embeddings in total, right? So text and multimodal. I see the other one, batch embedding predictions on the screen. That's my first. There's just a, like you can either do one-on-one -on -one or you can do batch. That's the method of it. Okay. Uh, we know multimodal definitely support video images and all, right? Does it do vice versa? Like on the responses, can it create a short video or an image or a chart or anything? Not like the that? generation. This, is, this has nothing to do with generation. So this is only as simple as if you have an image, text or a video and you want numbers as an embedding so that you can then do your cosine similarities and that's all it does. It doesn't do generation, it doesn't do all of those fancy things, right? Okay. The goal of this API, these two APIs, is to just give you numbers. That's it. Thanks. So what is the expected length of video chunk? Um, How many frames? I should there? know that. Uh, I think it's 10 minutes or 5 minutes, but it's there in the documentation. That's why I give you access to the documentation. It's, it's somewhere 5 minutes or 10 minutes or 20 MB or something, but it's somewhere there. But there is a limit. And this is why you have to interface. You can either do batch, so you can cut, let's say if you have for some reason one hour, you cut that by whatever the standard limit is, 10 MB, 20 MB, and then some process the whole thing in batch. Okay, uh, we'll stop. Yeah, I'll take the last one. But the majority of corpus would be English here, right? So how you will manage the language like Japanese and all that in multilingual set, right? So uh, English and Japanese are supported. 90% 90, 90 of the usually corpus nowadays is in embedding models is English. So you are saying like you are in, first of all in the multi-model space and uh, I don't know, maybe I need to see the document or data set that you are using it here, right? Because most of the I've seen in embeddings is 92% English, 89% English. With that kind of ratio, we are also having more complexities of video frames into it, right? Those so are separate. So that's why there are two APIs. So one is just the text that has everything to do with text and it has multilingual. The multimodals are separate. Multimodals are image, video, and image caption as well. So that has nothing to do with text. You're right. If they were the same, then there will be a confusion. But they are separate. So there's just the text one, and then there's just the multimodal. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And Perfect. Uh, Let's. Uh, just yeah. sorry, one question. Yeah. Like before embedding, like how do you choose the ideal chunk size and chunk overlap? Like for example, like if how I much chunk to do? I'll come to that. Okay. I'll come. To that. That's a very important question, but something we'll not sort of talk too much about that's almost like you know uh, like when you train a model what parameters to do my experience of it is you it depends on the data that you have the amount of um, uh, sort of i forgot the word but the amount of sort of uh, knowledge that you need to keep in memory for it to answer but I, we can a i can answer you one on one if you want right cool. because that's the part i'm not sort of trying to focus i'm trying to sort of focus on how do you solve the multimodal problem, right? That's, uh, there are thousands of other elements around it, but we'll sort of try to solve the f just one part. Okay, so let's do this. Uh, I'm gonna open up. We have 47 minutes left, actually. Uh, so let's, let's uh, try to sort of do, and then I'll take a lot of questions towards the end. So I'm just opening this up. Uh, like I said, the, the notebook that we're gonna solve is sitting here. Uh, the intro to multimodal drag. This is the notebook that you'll see, which is running on the uh, inside the workbench. By the way, it doesn't stop you to run this on Colab as well. We have actually given you a run in Colab. The only thing is, for you to run this in Colab, you need to authenticate your notebooks with your uh, account, whatever that, which has the billing enabled. So that's why I'm not showing you here because sort of uh, it creates issues sometimes. Okay, so we are here. Um, it automatically does the git clone. So again, when you actually go to the same lab, it will do the git clone for you, so you don't have to do that. Um, but if you wish to, you can. So let me open that same notebook. OK, perfect. So tell me if this is visible in the back, right? Let me sort of set the 
Is this good? Is this better? Everybody in the back who is standing. Some of you should go back and let them sit. <laughs> it's going to be one hour, so I'm really sad they are standing. Okay. So we'll go through uh, step by step, and again, I'm sort of not running this online because it may or may not sort of work. Um, I don't want to take that risk. But um, let me first show you the document. Sort of, where is that? Oh, in fact, let me sort of do that. So the document that we are going to work with is this. So again, I showed you this thing uh, very similarly in the presentation as well. Um, but what we are trying to address is, and by the way, this is a handcrafted sort of example, just to show that you know we can solve something like this. This is taken from the original 10K, Google 10K document. So if I click on the original link, which is given at the top, you can see this is a 100-page document. But this is the kind of documents we are trying to solve, right? In this document, if you go, there are sort of bunch of text. There are sort of tables. So if I come down, you'll start seeing that there are random tables in between. This is a very typical financial document. Like You'll all see this in your enterprise one way, the, one way or the other, right? Uh, not only this, but this also sort of has uh, uh, graphs. Like You can see like really huge tables at some point. So what we did was we basically took some samples out of it because again, we are trying to make sure that people can run this. So we took a 14 page handcrafted examples out of it. And the document that we end up doing is this. So this is pretty much sort of, like I said, you have graph, you have text um, and things like that. Now let's define the problem statement. The problem, the problem statement one is a, I should be able to convert these text images into numbers. That's problem statement one. Second, I have some information which is sitting inside the table and I want to know that answer. Can I do this with normal rack? No, right? Because that's sitting in the image, right? And again, I'm not saying can I do this with Gemini or anything because I want you to be very clear that this has nothing to do with the LLM in general. If you pick a multimodal LLM, you can still solve the same problem as long as you have all the components. So I'm not trying to over index on that as well. So these are the two problems that I want to ask a question where the answer clearly is available in some form of images. Can I get the answer out of it? And this is the data that I do, right? So, okay. The first thing is we build the metadata. So when I say metadata, this simply means that for those of you who have experienced RAG, you know that the first thing you do is you build the indexing, right? You build the sort of, you take the data, you get the embeddings and all of that. So this is this is exactly what is happening. But here's the funny part. If I go back to this table, I can do embedding of this table, right? I can use the multimodal API, get the numbers out. But how would I know what is available in this? How would I get that information? Any guesses? Like for example, uh, the United States, EMEA, APAC, numbers, something, right? And let's say if I'm asking, hey, what's the EMEA number for 2021? Embeddings won't be able to give me the exact answer, correct? It can give me that, hey, I, I think your answer is available in this image. What is that answer? It won't tell me. What do I do to solve this problem? Yeah, anybody? You have to read the text. You can get the captions. Okay, and I, I heard somebody saying OCR as well, which is also true. Okay, so the way we try to solve this problem, there are many different ways you can do this. So one is, of course, the very typical OCR. OCR can extract the data out of this and sort of store it in the context and sort of just keep it. Sometimes the answer to these table or whatever the text which is given is also available in the document itself, right? But we have made this more complex in a sense that we actually excluded that information. In the actual document, those details are there. We could have picked, but we have actually excluded it. So what we do is, and let me show you that this actually is a very simple thing, is if I go back to the code, and while building the metadata, do you see the prompt that I'm putting on Gemini? In fact, yeah. See the prompt I'm putting on Gemini. Yeah. 
See, we said Gemini has capability to know what's going on in the in the image, right? So I can use Gemini to get that data out and then store it as the metadata. Sounds good? I can do that, right? Let's do this. So I copy this. There's a whole code that sort of does this in the back end, but let, let's just see whether we are able to do this here, right? So I go to the multimodal. Um, I go to this and I put this here and I go to, let's say this table. All I'm going to do is I'm going to simply take a screenshot uh, so that, you know, I can run through this and I'll save it in the desktop. Okay, so the same prompt in the same place. Yes, this is the one. Uh, I should not be doing this live, but anyway, uh, let's give it a try. So you saw what I'm doing, right? So I had the image, screenshot image of that table. I have a simple prompt which just says that explain blah, blah, blah. See the response? Right, it gives you whatever is there in that table. Now, uh, what will OCR help here? Like if I were to sort of do the OCR, what will it help me with? To find the? Right, or maybe just to ground it? Right, I can say, hey, here's a table, use OCR data, here's the output of that data, tell me what, see, here's something which I forgot to sort of stress on. I am not asking it to tell me the numbers. In fact, the last do not include any numbers that are not mentioned. What I'm doing is I'm asking it to do an inference or a comparative sort of inference out of it. Explain me what's going on. So it's not only extracting the numbers or exact details, but it's telling you what's going on. See the description one more time. So let me show you the actual image. This was that image that we sent to Gemini and see the output. Do you see the difference of OCR output versus this output? The OCR will give you the numbers that I don't deny. And you should use that output here just as a contextual uh, uh, part of it, right? But what this is telling you is much more contextual. It's telling you what's going on in the table. It's taking the data here and there and doing things. So that is the very important aspect that we do. So what we're doing in our case is we take all the images in the data we send to Gemini and we run the same prompt to all these images and saying, tell us what's going on. If it's a graph, tell us what's happening in the graph. If it's a table, tell us what's happening in the table and so on and so forth, right? So all this images. So now, if you notice the output of this, it's going to each page, see processing page one, page two, and the moment it finds the image, it is sending that image to Gemini and doing exactly what I showed you in one example. So far, so good, are you guys with me? So this particular aspect of the code, um, and again, like I said, all the codes are open source, feel free to sort of do, uh, uh, inquire what's going on. But this whole step is building the metadata. It, ex it is extracting all the images, sending to uh, Gemini, asking it to sort of give you back. Let me actually show you one more example. So if I go, so you saw the table example, right? What if I were to send it a graph? Uh, this one. Again, what will your OCR do in this case? Can it tell what is happening in this graph? No, right? This is very interesting. Like th we don't have a technology that can tell us. Let's give it a try. Again, I save this image. I'm saving this in desktop. I'm going to the same prompt. I'm not changing the prompt. I am just inserting the media now with uh, the new screenshot. This is, I, I don't know if this is visible in the back, but if you clearly see that it's, it's, it's the same graph, right? The one that we took a screenshot. Okay, let's see what happens. So I do the submit. And by the way, on the right hand side, you can see the token limit, the temperatures and all. I'm not even playing with that. That's why I'm saying I'm not focusing on uh, the optimization part of it. We are just seeing the raw format of things, right? Just see the output. Again, remember, this is the graph we sent to Gemini, and this is the output. So it says the graph comparing the cumulator five-year total return of Alphabet, Class C stock, the S&P, the NASDAQ, and the RDG, right? 
So it does the same elements like OCR, but it is also sort of correlating the information together. It's telling you that this graph is doing the five-year cumulative, right? So this is very interesting because we can leverage this information, right? So far, so good. Any questions on this? This makes sense? Yes. How is it able to know about all the acquisitions? Which one? Oh, the, the bottom one? Yeah, because we have not asked it to sort of ground itself so far. So it's this is hallucination, by the way. Welcome. Uh, and the temperature is sort of slightly high, but very good catch. Like, so we have not sort of done any sort of way to ground this. And this is why I said you should always make sure that you're giving the output of the OCR, no matter, again, which models you're using. It's very important because something, even one single line of this comes up and your whole analysis will get tuned, right? So it's very important that you ground these information, but this is generally because you're asking it to do that, it will give you extra bit of information. Yeah. One more, uh, can yes. Uh, is there a limitation on the resolution of the age method that you zoomed out? Uh, so does it really matter? Yes, so there, but I didn't do it for that purpose. I was just sort of trying to show you. But there is a, so if you give a very low resolution, there is a chance that it misses out. Typically, 1024, like the 180p, the middle one is the best one. Um, what we have noticed is, and we have this is again sort of coming from re Google research as well, is that if you go beyond a 4K resolution, you have a negative return in that case. So there's a lot of unnecessary information that comes. Because remember, all of this is happening on the pixel levels, right? The more data that you have, the more confusion you also create in that. So you need to find a balance in between. And from a Google research point of view, we know this is somewhere in between. Yes. How well does it do on um, Actually, we have an example. I can show you maybe one-on-one. -on -one. You would not use this to sort of do a OCR of the hands-on, if that's what your question is. But if your question is, I have two handwritten things, and if there's something comparative I want to do, yes, you can. But you need to ground them using the good OCRs that can do that translation. And I hope this point is clear, right? These are not, this is not an OCR tool. You're not going to use this to do the translation of what OCRs are already good at doing. I hope this is clear, right? This is more where you're trying to get a bit of more information out, which is just beyond the numbers, the text, which is written. Correct? OK. Yes. In, in my typical product manuals, I do have a lot of architectural diagrams where there are boxes, there right. are arrows going on. So if we give that sort of images, will it help in explaining the logical flow of that architecture? Yes. Uh, there is a demo. Uh, in fact, you can take a screenshot of this. If this opens, um, it did. Um, sorry? Oh, did Ravi show you this? Again, if you have attended Ravi's session, he might have shown you this. Again, the code for all of this is available on the same repo. But this has an example where there's a, uh, uh, oh no, sorry, I'm opening a different one. Uh, Something like summarizing the um, entire product architecture. It does. So if I go to the image playground, uh, it has an example of ER diagram. And I think you're asking somewhat very similar, right? It does that. It has. But again, be very careful that it's, you have to ground these things. Again, no matter which model you pick, you pick GPT-4V, you pick uh, uh, Gemini, you have to be very clear with this because it looks amazing, but the more you get into details, you'll start noticing that there are things here and there which are not true. So make sure that you're grounding more and more. Since you mentioned about GPT-4 already now. GPT-4V, so, yes. Yeah, so any comparative studies also gone into like between Gemini and GPT-4 or? So GPT-4V is not uh, natively multimodal. So there is ideally not a comparison that you can do. For the text, there are, uh, in, the, in the report, they do have comparisons. Okay. Not for the multimodal because they are natively not multimodal. They combine the image and that together. Okay, understood. Okay, so I'm going to sort of quickly go back to the hands-on so that we can finish this. Okay, so once we do that, uh, we essentially get the data which is coming out. Uh, so you can see that we have the text embedding, which I showed you in the image. So now you have the text for each page and then see what you get for images. So each images that you actually extracted, what you have here is uh, essentially the image description. This is coming from Gemini. So when you send those images to Gemini, Gemini gave you some answers. And then what you do with that is you create multimodal embeddings out of those things. So 
start from the left and go towards the right, you will start seeing whenever there is MM written, it's a multimodal embedding. Whenever there is text written, it's a text embedding. So let's see the first one. It says multimodal embedding from text description and image. What it means is we have taken the image and the Gemini description and sent to multimodal embedding. Because remember we said, right, you can actually give a caption of the image as well for the uh, embedding. So the first embedding is this. The second is just this image. We send this image to the multimodal and you get the numbers out. And the last one is the text embedding from the description because it's just a text, there's no image. So now, if I were to, and this is again an open question, if you have these three embeddings, can you tell me what kind of things you can do now? We'll come to the rag later. Uh, that's the grand reveal. But uh, apart from the rag, like what are the basic things that you can do with this now? So you again see, you have multimodal embedding. So you have these three numbers now one of which is the image. So this represents the image in numbers. This is only Gemini description and numbers. And this is Gemini description and image both together in numbers. If I, w if you're sort of confused, only consider the last two columns. So the image number, the image embedding and the text embedding of the Gemini output. What all can you do? Raise your hands. Tell me. Similarity search. Similarity search between what? Vectors. Text and image. Yeah. Okay, good. What else? Can I find similarity between two images? Yes. Okay, good. Can I find similarity between two descriptions? If I have a question, can I find which is the closest to that? Whether this image is close or whether this text is close to that? We can do clustering. We can find all the close things. That's pretty much. See, we're building that the whole thing step by step, right? So we're already at a stage where A, you can cluster all the similar images, so all the tables which are talking about, let's say, for whatever reason, uh, cost of something, you'll be able to sort of cluster them. If you have a table, let's say, and you're like, hey, I want all the tables which are similar to this table, can I get all those tables? I can, right? Because I have what? Both the image as well as the image description. So I can use both the embeddings and get to the best answer. Is this making sense? Right? And we have not even considered the original data which is available in the document, which is this embedding. Correct? So now, is everybody clear? We have, how many embeddings do we have now? Four. One is your plain text in a document. Traditional plain text, which means you can do all sort of things with this. The three other embeddings are the embeddings which are coming from your images. So one is image plus Gemini description. The other is image only image description. Uh, sorry, only image, and the third is image description. Right? Okay. So far, so good. Any questions? Yes. When you say image uh, only embedding, so when you say image only embedding, what does it exactly mean? Like, is that the output we got from uh, Gemini, and it is the embedding of that? Or okay. Good question. So just to clarify. From image only means you took an image and you called the multimodal embedding API and it gave you number. That's it. You didn't pass any text. You didn't pass the text which Gemini gave you. It's just the image. So it's as as good as saying the image uh, image got encoded into numbers, whatever those images are, right? So this is the image only. It's a separate encoder model. Uh, it's not the TF idea. It's a separate. Again, but you can sort of read about yeah. that more in detail. Um, the image description that you see here is only going in this. And that's why if you notice, it says text embedding. It doesn't say sort of other embedding, right? So why? Because it's just taking the description of the uh, Gemini in that case, right? Any other question? I have a question. Yes, I'll take this and we'll come. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, and I showed you that example, right? The Rome one where you do the few shot. You can do few shot. You can say, hey, here's what I'm looking. Here are the, fi by the way, I have an example. So we'll see that. Sorry, yes. Yeah. Uh, so for the same table, now I have three embeddings, right? Yes. Now, when I when I ask a question, I can get like, when I check the similarity scores, I'll get three numbers from it. And it will be different, right? So how, which one do I trust? No, actually, so we'll not leverage all of them together. We'll use them one by one. See. 
you can go crazy with this which is what you are trying to do <laughs> but you can sort of just do step by step and that's why i'm saying be do the crazy when you go back because i want you to take something from this session and really think about it that this is easy to do so we'll go there we'll take each embedding one at a time so i'll not try to sort of combine because you're absolutely right if i were to sort of do all four then how do i choose which to pick and which not and that's something for maybe later sessions right okay so let's get to so now that i have these two tables and i have these two tables separately because one of them is only representing the text and the other is representing the image if for whatever reason you have vi uh, video or audio i don't know which documents have those but let's assume for a moment that you have youtube videos you have some audio files you can imagine right you can do the same thing and you have the third data frame which the video and the audios are there and then you can sort of do things which are combinations of it okay let's start by solving few problems because now what you'll see is what you'll see is that we have certain things and we'll use those metadata to get to the answer part here's my first query my first query is i need details uh, for basic and diluted net income per share for class a class b class c share for google now i should tell you this and we have written this in the description that this is a very fabricated query we know that the answer of this lies in a table right so it may look like a magic that oh how did it figure out but we actually sort of tried to fix it because we said hey i need this answer but this answer is not available in the text this answer is available in the image let's see by using embedding can we get the answer of it right this is very interesting right so the first thing that i do is and again i'm using the direct functions if you want to know what these functions are and what are they doing you can again go back to the utils and see that but let's see what you have to see every time i'm calling a function is the column name can somebody tell me what is that i'm calling here what embedding am i calling here the text one right and that too for the chunk so i have the question what is happening inside this function is as simple as doing a cosine similarity as and you all know what cosine similarity is when you have two vectors you take a cosine theta if it is close to sort of uh, one it means similar if it is close to zero it means sort of very dissimilar right so it does all of that behind the scene but what it does is it gives you this so see and tell me whether it is answering the question so again the question was the detail for basic diluted net income per share for blah 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 it went to all the text in fact it tells you the page number chunk number in that page the score this score is the cosine score and it gives you the text does it answer that no it won't right like i said the reveal was that the answer is not there but you can see that even if you were to even if you were trying to do this it didn't give us the answer and be uh, like what we need to remember is that we are using the text embedding as of now we are not even touching the image part how about if we do the same again i call the same uh, very similar function this time get similar image from query see what i'm passing now am i passing the image embedding or text embedding correct so whatever gemini gave as the output of that i'm doing i'm using the text embedding so that's all you have to care so when i do this the moment i change this here's the output see the basic net income per share diluted net income basic net income see the combination that happened again can somebody explain me what just happened anybody who can raise hand and tell me how did we get to this answer anybody it could be wrong there was no image description so far uh, sorry there's no image embedding image yeah, matching it's so it's a text uh, embedding of that image right of so the, uh, of the description image. of uh, that the gemini gave again remember what this is right what is that we are sending here Oops, so the sorry. image is getting transformed into a text embedding and then it is matching it with the keywords mm -hmm. that have been uh, uh, given as an input and the closest match Uh, or the highest uh, score that the we got the cosine of that yeah, right is what we got here anybody else who would like to give it a try this is very important because this See, one. yes maybe from this particular text are we trying to create some image and then trying to compare no no there's no image generation no. all we are trying to do is we are trying to get the answers out with the combination of image and text 
I have uh, a question here. Or the, or the query itself is trying to get into the Gemini LLM first. It is. Yeah. It is. Why it is? Because it's doing the embedding of the image description. Image description is what? The output of the Gemini. So you are taking the output of Gemini. Off that you're taking the embedding. And then you're saying, hey, my query, find the closest to that. So you are using Gemini in this case. Right? Does that make sense? Right, right, right. So I'm saying like the query itself is rephrased now so that it will closely match with my Gemini text output. And from that cosine similarity, maybe we are getting this image out. That, that could so be there is no rephrasing, which is, it's just a pure uh, okay. mathematical matching, which is happening. So you have the query, query gets converted into embedding. You have the image descriptions, which we took from Gemini of all images. All of them got converted into numbers and we're just doing the match between it. That's all we're doing, right? Does that, does that make sense? Somebody had a question. I, I have a question. Yes. So how are you getting the output as image because uh, you're passing the embeddings of description, right? Correct. How, how is it eventually an image? Ideally, it should have been description that is the output of Gemini, right? You tell me. Are Figure you taking it, out. it Think back from it. the table? Yes, yes. Okay. Now do you realize why we were doing this in a table? Because, I mean, let's go back to the table. If I know this is the embedding that got matched with my query, I already know which image is this. Okay. That right? It's not a scam. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's a good question. Like, how would I know? Because I already know that this is that embedding. And this is why if you go back to the code, right, all of this you'll be able to get. And hence, we are maintaining this metadata. This is why I'm glad you actually said that because nobody really appreciates why we build the whole thing. In fact, some people say, why are you doing all of this? Like, just do this in one go, right? But because we are maintaining, in fact, you notice we are maintaining so many things. We know the page number. So you could actually, I can actually tell you that this image that I found of the question you're asking is available on this document, this page number. Why? Because I'm maintaining all of that. Right? Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Uh, could you go back to the function, please? This one? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, here it looks like you already know that the answer will be in an image, right? That's why you are using that uh, this one, uh, that function, right? So, but we would not know, right? So when you are asking the question, we might not know if the answer lies in an image or in a or in the text yes, part. So yes, yes, and that's what his question was. Like that's what he was asking. Uh, so he was you like, "You are being smart right. that you know this, and then you are showing us this." But what when we have to do? We have to pick one, right? We have to pick which one. I'll come to that towards the end. Okay. Yeah. First, let's see whether we are able to solve the problem or not, right? We we'll, the architectures of how to do this this at scale we'll figure out towards the end, right? So far, we'll go step by step. The, this makes sense, right? Even though, and this is why I told you, I know this. I've taken this query because I knew that the answer was there. Right, but we'll come to how do you figure out and all of that. Okay, let's see the second example. Um, and by the way, it also has a function that gives you the citation. So this is what I was telling you, right? Like you can actually so uh, there's a citation function which is uh, print text to image citation. See, it tells you the score as well, so you know which one to trust. So you know the scoring methods also. So it tells you the path. This is the image page number, and this is that text. This text is coming from where? The Gemini. This is not available in the document essentially, right? All right, let's take the second example. This one is the image search. You all said if you have embeddings of the images, you can do image search. Let's see whether we can. So I have this table, very simple table, um, which is a tag table revenue. Again, this is sort of available there. You can sort of download this. What this table has is uh, it has a TSE and bunch of numbers. It has other cost of revenue, total cost of revenue, and things like that. This time, I will not use Gemini. What will I use this time? Multimodal embeddings, because I'm trying to find the similar image. Gemini cannot help me there. Why? Because Gemini is not an embedding model. I'm not looking for the explanations of it, right? So let's see this. What do you see here now? Again, same function, get similar image from query. This time, my query is image itself. So I'm sending an image, and I'm using which Embedding the multimodal. It's not the text one. When I do that, it gives me this result. And again, you can run all of this. It will give you the same results. Um, how is this matching with the previous one? Can somebody tell me? So see, you see cost of revenue. I think I see cost of revenue, other cost of revenue. But here's the thing. Did we pass the Gemini description to this? No, right? 
But how did fit, how did then figure out these things? We didn't pass the description. We didn't pass any caption. But how? yes. The image matching, right? So be very careful while it is sort of giving you and sometimes I've seen people getting, oh my God, how did it figure out? It's just a pixel mapping, right? Just because these pixels are converted into numbers, they will sort of represent the same in the vector space. So you do see cost of revenues and all. Okay, so you were able to find the image from the text query. You were able to find the image with the image. So far, so good. Okay, we'll go to the third example. And by the way, again, you can sort of do all the citations. You can see all the other images which were sort of there and things like that. So this is my favorite one because this is where you actually see the comparative reasoning where you are sort of going, uh, you're trying to sort of combine the last two things that we did. So let's see what we have. I have a image, right? This is my image, which is a class A share, which is some image like this. And I have a question. So this time, I am not just sending one thing at a time. I'm sending two things. One is the image. The second thing that I'm sending is the query, what I have, the question that I have, and the instruction. So let's see the question. The question is, how has NASDAQ performed with respect to class A and class B shares of Google? Whatever the answer. What is that I'm sending to it? I'm sending this image. Is this a class A or class B? This is a class A share graph, right? What am I asking? Class A and class B. Does it have class B? What should it be doing is, it should be A figuring out which images are class B because that's the query that I'm asking. And then it should be able to answer me. This, this will be mind blown like if, if it, it was able to do that. But even before I show you this, do you think we can do this now? Because you've seen the previous two examples. Right? It's, it's very simple for us because, and again, we have given instructions as well. Because this time you're using a layer of LLM. So it's not just a simple matching, but after the matching, you're using a layer of LLM, which is what we saw in the rag, right? The retriever and the generator. So now because we are using the layer of generator, we have the instruction. What is the instruction saying? Compare two images and base your reasoning only on the images provided. Provide details, reason of your conclusions, right? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so let's see the code. So the first thing is, I am going to find the similar images. That's the first thing. So the image that we gave, I need to find the most similar images of it. So what is that I'm using for that? The multimodal embedding. Okay, good. So far, so good. What is the next stage in this? What is this line doing? Anybody who can tell me? It's very descriptive that way, right? So I got the best image. I got multiple images that got sort of compared. I took the first image. And again, I'm sort of trying to do this in the as simple as possible so that we don't get confused. So we take the most the first one. And then I create this what you see here is a Gemini calling, right? So first thing I do is I create the query, the whole query. Let's see what we have in the query, you have the instructions, the instructions that we wrote, you have the image object, which is coming from here. Uh, sorry, which is coming from the user image. Uh, and that's why it says user image object. And then it has selected image object and then the compare query. Now, if you go up, see what we have written as an instruction. Um, so it says compare two images and base your reasoning only on two. So you're telling Gemini again that, hey, I'm going to give you these two images. I have a question. Answer that question based on that. Is the flow making sense? And then finally, we are asking Gemini, get Gemini response, passing all of this, and we are asking it to sort of do this. Is the flow making sense? So we had a question. We had an image, let's say a reference image. We said, first, let me find the most close image to the reference image that we have. Once I have that, I'm going to ask Gemini that, hey, here's all the images which are close. Can you sort of give me the answer that I'm looking forward to? So this is what it found. It found the image, which is a class C image. And this is the answer that you get. Yes. So uh, here we know that we don't have uh, the overall answer into that image. But it's a yes. So that we are already aware of. 
that we are seeing that image and we are seeing that there is no the, the total answer is not there. Correct. But correct. how do I know that? Because it's we are passing that. Then only I will pass and ask the this one to search the B one, right? Correct. So your question is that hey, um, you took the first image, which correct. you know you, when you match, you got the first image, and you are sending it. Correct. Why are you taking that leap of faith? Because it could be any image, right? Like Correct. Maybe, maybe that image has the whole answers as well. Correct. And that's and the, why... And this step is not needed. Correct. This step is not needed. This is again, like I said, you will find the loopholes in the process, but our goal is to sort of understand whether we are able to solve the problem because the other thing is all the architectural details. So for example, if you actually see, when I do the first image, in the bottom of it, I actually show you how to get all the other images as well. So you're right absolutely that in the second image, I'm assuming that when both of them you'll get, you'll be able to answer that. Again, I'm assuming. This is why I said the whole example is a crafted example so that I can show you that this is possible. And then you experiment with your data to see whether this is making sense or not. So you're right in thinking, very right. And this is what I want you to think after the session that, oh, I see one example working. Can I take it back and do this experiment to see whether it works with my examples or not? And what do I need to do in that case? Right? Does that make sense? Oh, sorry. Uh, I didn't show you. Sorry, the answer is there. It, it was not there. The answer is when I actually ran this, it says the cumulative total return of class A shares has outperformed the cumulative total return both the NASDAQ composite and class C shares. Now, I, I need to sort of change both the graphs actually because uh, visually you can't see the difference, but if you actually mathematically calculate, this answer is correct. Uh, but obviously when you see both the graphs visually, they both sort of go in the above direction. Oh, I have 10 minutes left. Okay, good. So it tells you by doing that, and this is the image it was able to find uh, or sort of figure out that this image is closest to it, right? But is this flow making sense? How we were able to sort of combine the previous two very basic matching and then add a layer of generator to ask a specific question. So this means that this is a very bare minimum of how to do a multimodal drag. Does that, does that make sense? Any questions on this before we move to the to manipulate the data in terms of like the fact that the images might change as well yeah i mean it's it's in your control so you change the metadata as you wish that's completely on you okay so we have seen a very basic now the last thing that we'll see is the final sort of flow of rag right this is again everything that we have seen so far sort of coming together or sort of coming uh, in one go so let me show you the query that we have this is the same question that we were asking this time, I'm not even going to send the image also. See, we are sort of increasing the complexity step by step, right? In the previous stage, I had the image and the text. This time, I will not even have the image. I will just have a question. The question is, how has NASDAQ and S&P uh, performed with respect to class A share and class C share? Which one would be a better to buy and why? Very simple, weird query. This time, we don't even pass the images. Let's see how do we solve this problem because the outputs are very straightforward. You'll be able to sort of see, but I want to sort of focus on the steps of achieving it, right? And it's very simple. You'll now get this, right? Okay. So the step one is the user gives a query in a text format where the expected information is available in the document and is embedded in images and text. That's the first thing. And you give the query find and these step two and step three is important. See. When, I, when you have a simple, image, uh, simple text query, tell me, can I find all the text which is going to answer this? Can I do that? I will use what to do this? The text embedding, right? The simple text search that we saw. Can I do the same thing with all the images? The same question, but now I go to all the embeddings of the images the image description one and the actual image and I find all the answers together. So what I do in step two and step three distinctively, it's not sort of combined together. And by the way, this is what addresses his question, right? How do you sort of do everything where you don't give on your own, right? So the step two is you do the text search. So let me show you this. This is the step two. What am I doing in step two? I'm using the embeddings of text. I'm finding all available information in the text of the query everything. 
then I get all relevant images. I'm not passing any images, but see what I'm doing here. Wit embedding I'm using here. The text embedding. Now this is where you can actually do step 3A, step 3B, step 3C. Why? Because you can say I want to do this with text embedding. I want to do this with multimodal embedding and I'm going to combine all of this together. Right? And we'll see in the moment how you're going to use Gemini to resolve that answer finally for you. Is this clear? Can I do step 3A, step 3A, step 3B, step 3C? Because I have three embeddings of image, right? So I find all of that. Now what I do is I create context text and context images. Can somebody tell me what these two things are? Just by seeing the code. Whatever the text got matched, I combine all of them together, add it as the context text. All the images that I found, the object of that I combined in the context image. Now that's it. That's all you need to do because finally we run a, uh, we run this. Let me sort of put this in a different line so that you see the full prompt. I'm going to give you some, uh, let me give you one minute. See the prompt and tell me if this makes sense to you. This is my final prompt that I'm doing to Gemini to get me the answer or the question that I asked. Right? So what is that I'm doing? I'm passing the instruction. I'm passing the text. I'm passing all the images that I have. And then I'm just sitting aside and I'm saying, hey, I've given you everything that's possible from the given data, all these similar images, all these similar texts, whatever I could find of the question that you've asked, I've given you everything. That's why the final resolution of the answer, no matter which embedding you use, you can use all the three. You can say, here are my three images or three kinds of images. Here are my five or 10 images. You send all of that to Gemini or to any LLM. So this is where you choose any LLM, which is a multimodal LLM, which can read through images, text, video, and audio. And you send this whole prompt. And then what this will do is this. So this time, we didn't send any image. We just had a question. And this answer that you're seeing is coming by doing the comparative reasoning, understanding between different images. This is where when he was asking that, hey, uh, you knew that that image existed and that's why you're sending. But this time I didn't do any cheating, right? If you really think about it, I didn't. I just asked the question and I just sent whatever I got and I just waited for it to answer. And then you can see it actually gave us the analysis of the whole thing. There is a limitation for this context length, right? That you're passing. Yes. You cannot send everything. Uh, yes. By everything, here, right? that was a hyperbole in a sense that I meant that everything that I, I think is important, which means it doesn't mean that you'll send 100 of sort of text or 100 of images. So for images, um, I think the limit is 10, like the 10 images, each of eight or five MB or something. So that's the limit. So you can send 10 images here overall in the prompt. Uh, with the text, I think the context window is um, 8K with the model that I'm using, 8K tokens. And, and nowhere we are talking about ranking those, let's say you got 20 or 30 images. And so ranking was done here. So this code, this code when we run, this is already doing the ranking in top the back. Top n equal to three. Correct, Good. top n. Okay. So it's doing that top three. I forgot to mention this, but this sort of code that we are using again and again, this is doing the ranking in the back. Now, this is where the questions like, hey, what should be the chunk size? What kind of ranking should I do? I'm not even touching that. These are all the things that you can explore. These are all the uh, belts and uh, sorry, different kind of things that you can actually sort of go back and change. But this is pretty much the end to end. So that's it. Uh, I'm going to show you that you can, because now you have the answer, you can actually get all the citations. So these are all the images it looked into. These are all the data that it found out. And like this, it was able to sort of make the whole thing. So I'll stop here. There's this